we are. I'm excited to be back in the room with you. I yeah, missed you. Great. Yeah, I missed you a little bit. You've had a good morning, though. It's been an amazing morning. Yeah, it's been amazing great. conversations. Um, <laughs> it just everyone on the stage, every presentation has been incredible. But more important, we've been bringing this up over several conversations around responsible and ethical AI. So we get to sit here with Dr. Rahman Chowdhury, and your your background is so extensive. You've worked for some of the top tech companies in the world, done incredible research. Can you talk to us and, and talk to our audience here that's joining us for the live stream a little bit about your background, and then we'll dive into um, this idea of responsible AI in e-commerce. Sure. Um, so as the intro said, I'm a data scientist and a social scientist. And what that means and what my passion has always been is using data to understand aspects of human beings and humanity. So why do we want to use technology and what do people want out of technology? Fundamentally, it's about what is the balance of power between human beings and the technological world that's being built. And my perspective is that technology should serve people. So like responsible AI was actually a very natural field for me to be in, even though it's not a field that's existed for very long. Mm -hmm. The idea that we need to focus on technology being built responsibly is actually not a muscle that a lot of people had built. It's, it's a very mm -hmm. new reflex. And it's been really fun these past few years, as you've mentioned, working with every major tech company, Fortune 500 companies, and even smaller startups and companies that aren't naturally in tech to help them make that transition, but also do in a way that's mindful about their customers and you know what, where they want their company to go. Yeah. Well, it's great to uh, be here with another fellow Accenture alum. Yes. So, you know, a little fist bump <laughs> there. Shout out to all the Accenture uh, folks out there. I feel a left, little left out. Sorry. I wasn't as part of the Accenture, but that's They would fine. love to have well, you. We, we've got, we've got the Columbia. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, I need a fist bump, too. Yeah. Here we go. Um, I'm kind of interested, you know, that obviously it's very topical. Um, lots of lots of articles, a lot of discussion, discussions around dinner tables, in boardrooms, in the media, and in government about ethics and inclusivity uh, with generative AI and AI in general. What do people not really appreciate or understand about the depth of that issue? Because it's easy to kind of keep it on the surface and talk about maybe bias or strange hallucinations or the training data that may have been used, or but even, I'm sure it goes far deeper than that. Or I'm even just, runaway AI, like yeah, the robots runaway. are gonna come take over. <laughs> oh, right? now, now you're going. The dystopian, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Access, yeah. Well, robots are definitely not gonna take over, so that part I can really confidently <laughs> say. And so I think the part that people don't often understand is it's actually reliving the same human power Such dynamics, right? yeah. institutional dynamics, and it's increasingly consolidating more power, wealth, and authority right. into fewer and fewer companies um, under this guise of, you know, I, I think I'd mentioned this in my keynote, like coding things with data to make it seem mm -hmm. objective, right? Mm -hmm. So some of these problems are not problems that have clear yes right. or no answers. Right. So for example, think of political misinformation. Literally what is political inf misinformation and not is a highly debatable topic. So we're not talking about like traditional information security where it's a good guy and a bad guy, right? It's actually more like a well-intentioned person is seeing something that's like 30% fact, 70% fiction, believing some part of it and propagating it. Well, where's the vector where you solve that problem? Are we educating and people? And who gets to decide? And who gets to decide? Like, uh, excellent point, a phrase I've been saying a lot lately mm -hmm. is the fundamental question is who gets to be the arbiter of truth? Mm -hmm. Who gets to decide what is toxic speech, what isn't toxic mm -hmm. speech, what is allowed, what is mm -hmm. not allowed? To what extent is this model able mm -hmm. to talk about mm -hmm. political situations or not? Mm -hmm. And also we're seeing examples of overcorrection mm -hmm. where in order to be overly sensitive on topics that are potentially controversial, some language model companies, some language models will say, well, we're yeah. just going to talk about yeah. it. And that too is problematic, right? Mm -hmm. Humanity is messy. The world is messy. Mm -hmm. It's actually a very beautiful thing. It's not something to be scared of mm -hmm. or run away from. So how do we face these questions head on knowing that there is no right answer? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So that kind of begs a follow-up question for me then is like, there's certainly an opportunity though for, for generative AI to create a more inclusive um, you know, dialogue and environment and whether it's language or slang or different cultural backgrounds and all these kinds of things kind of being, in a sense, 
taken off the table mm -hmm. because now we have systems that can that can support these different kinds of interactions. Mm -hmm. How do we how do we steer this that way? Yes, is for good, so to speak. Absolutely. Versus you know, and, and, and kind of manage that. What's the right way to yeah, do that? Yeah, I mean, I, I loved you brought up the idea of inclusion. So, I have a new nonprofit. It's called Humane Intelligence, and two weeks ago, we were part of co-creating the largest ever generative AI red teaming exercise. And hmm. red teaming is a practice that companies have used for a while. It's more well known in security field where usually it's group of, groups of experts, external experts are brought in by companies to basically break their models. What we did was we expanded it and we had 2,200 people come in and hack in a competition at every major large language model. And I mean, this was, mm, what, wow. what was so beautiful about this event was it's not just about people finding mm -hmm. problem. It's all, it's actually about people now feeling empowered mm -hmm. because they understand how to critically analyze the system. Mm -hmm. So you know, we've been talking for years about how every field needs to get, quote, smart about AI. What does it mean to be smart about it? Do they need to know how to program Python? Do you need to know what a Kubernetes cluster is? No, actually what I've realized is what people need to get smart on is critically analyzing the output that comes from tech. Mm -hmm. And this red teaming exercise and the whole focus of my nonprofit is to bring that information to a wide range of people. And this can mean professionals like the folks that are here today at the summit. Um, this can mean architects, this can mean doctors. Mm -hmm. So you know, this idea of inclusion mm -hmm. is about a wide range of people from different demographic mm -hmm. backgrounds, but it's also about people with different subject matter expertise and skill sets mm -hmm. who can yeah. come in and improve these models for different purposes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's such a range of companies that are represented today. Um, some that are larger have been doing business for years, mm -hmm. um, likely using AI for years in a variety of aspects. And some startups that are kind of, you know, adopting and filling in gaps around where AI either can be much more efficient and effective um, or um, filling in gaps where some of the new technologies are, are still kind of missing. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I have noticed from a trend perspective is these sort of ethics boards or committees mm -hmm. that are being created at companies and even at the university level. But I'm curious about if I'm a CEO of a new startup and my objective is the bottom line and growth and scale, and I just need to get the product in the hand of the user so that we can generate the revenue necessary to grow. How do I create a sense of auditing or mm -hmm. um, checkpoints to ensure that we are not causing harm or some of those challenges that exist um, are addressed, mm -hmm. but maybe I have a small team. Um, it, it just seems like there's a, there's a lot of work and almost a pause to be able to, to review that data to ask these kinds of questions, to have that kind of red team experience when you are stress testing what you're building. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm curious what your advice is for those 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 dev teams or the CTO or the the, the CEO that's thinking right. about this, they care about it, um, but how do you actually implement some kind of a process? Right, I mean, it's, it's tough. I mean, I, I think the thing I'd start with saying is that ethics and responsible use cannot be an afterthought. You can't go build your product and say, oh, well, now we're gonna go make sure it's ethical because to your point, some of it can actually be in the fundamental training data, the very building blocks of your mm -hmm. tech. And once you've built a product, you've put it out there, you can't actually go rewind. It's, yeah. it's really hard to do that. So one is just trying to build it by mm -hmm. design. I also do consulting in exactly what you're talking about because you're right, especially with the improved accessibility of AI due to the generative AI revolution, we're actually finding companies that aren't AI native moving into AI. So maybe mm -hmm. they were they were a B2C platform and they were selling something. I've actually had a couple of really great conversations say with companies that have said, yeah, I didn't, I didn't ever thought of that I would be a company using AI, but here I am using it for X, Y, and Z or curious about X, Y, and Z. But you're right, none of these companies have built out like a trust and safety aspect. So providing that kind of service, I think is that's frankly going to be a very, very big market. Absolutely. Slightly different kind of thing. One, one of the things I heard you sort of speak to, which I thought was really interesting. I mean, here we are, we're in the I guess the wine cellar or the wine bar of Silicon Valley, we are. right? Right. Uh, it's lovely up here. But you talked about the nanny state, mm -hmm. and I think it's really interesting to think about that. Having worked in technology for a long time, it really resonated with me. Yeah. And I thought the uh, it would be really interesting for you to kind of just kind of explain what that is and why it's important to think about like who's building it, 
what their lives are like, mm -hmm. and what they're thinking about versus maybe the general population or groups that we're talking about, you know, making this more inclusive and, and available. Yeah, I mean, you've just asked, you've raised four interesting points. <laughs> no, no, it's all like stuff like I love talking about. So first is, I always like to say I was not born of tech, right? So my first career was in public policy and nonprofits. I then went into academia. And mm -hmm. I actually didn't enter tech until my 30s. Mm -hmm. So I come into tech, which is a field that's generally populated by people while they're in college or after college. They have no idea what other industries are like. And I'm like, what is this world? <laughs> and then having lived in the Silicon Valley bubble for a bunch of years, it's funny, I left San Francisco and I moved to Texas to be closer to my family. And in Texas, I realized, right, like 99% of the world does not live like Silicon Valley. Yeah, and you get all. like, and, and it's interesting because when I first entered data science in 2012, 2013, the only place you could get that job was in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. Over time, it spread out. Now there's data scientists. Or everywhere. Seattle, in my case. Right, or yeah. Seattle. Yeah. Exactly. Like, there's like only two, literally, there's two yeah. cities you can get this job. Yeah. And you know, then it started to distribute mm -hmm. and be more global. And then with generative AI, again, it's like sucked back in. Now it's actually pretty much like New York and San Francisco, mm -hmm. yeah. with some in Seattle as well, mm -hmm. people who can build large language models. So I worry because, like, it, it is a 1%. I mean, you're right. We're sitting in Napa. We are not surrounded by reality. We are surrounded by a very particular slice of the world. And I actually have a really interesting anecdote that I've been sharing for years and something personally had happened to me. So I was in Norway giving a talk and it was January in Norway, really cold. And I have a really horrible sense of direction. So I turn on my maps feature on my phone. And I'm like, where am I going? Oslo is not a very big city, but I managed to get lost in it. <laughs> um, so here I am walking and as, and I'm watching my battery die until mm -hmm. it goes to zero. And I'm freaking out thinking my phone broke because it was hundred percent five minutes ago. I somehow make it to the venue. I go there and I'm like, oh my God, my phone died. Like blah, blah, blah. And everyone's like, oh no, no, it's fine. And they're like, they're laughing. I'm like, oh no, it happens. Apparently, most iPhones, mm -hmm. their batteries brick when it's below a certain temperature. The thing is, in Scandinavian countries in the winter, it is generally below that temperature. So people have hacked all sorts of So they of use places. phone warmers? Yeah. So, well, like, yeah. They, they almost like, like, like a mitten for yeah. your phone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, actually, the answer is, like, you just plug it back in for, like, 10 minutes. It's fine. But the whole point is, I'm like, I can't imagine this is an unsolvable problem. The thing is, here, it is never that cold. Mm. So while my watch knows whether I'm swimming a backstroke or a freestyle because that's a Silicon Valley problem. It is not a Silicon Valley problem to make sure that our phone's not going to brick at zero right. degrees Fahrenheit. So it's really interesting because we solve the problems we see. We solve the problems in our lives. So if we don't have a broad range of people mm -hmm. contributing, and this is where the red teaming comes in, actually getting literally everybody to be part of improving these models mm -hmm. in a very structured mm -hmm. fashion, we're not going to achieve the technological future mm -hmm. we imagine. Mm -hmm. That's such an interesting point as well, because even if the technology is being built in a microcosm, mm -hmm. the audience or the end user is all over, right? Right, Has a different reason why they may be coming to a website to shop for a particular need. Oh, absolutely. Has a lived experience that is being captured by small data points when we are on the site mm -hmm. um, overall. Talk to us about some of the trends and some of the potential developments that you're seeing, um, you know, particularly that we should be aware of in this e-commerce space. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of excitement around the potential for essentially personalized services, personalized shopper, personalized travel agent. And, you know, with the early days of chatbots, which was like around 2017, 2018, mm -hmm. We saw that kind of fall apart because these models are very brittle and they were basically tree-based yeah, structures. Kind of yeah, things, exactly. Yeah. Like it could not account for mm -hmm. the myriad of different ways that people ask the same question, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I want to go to Italy for my honeymoon. It can be asked multiple different ways, right? And getting at like all the different aspects of people's preferences to go design that really tough. Well, now it seems a lot more feasible with these language models. So there's a lot of excitement around these kinds of personalized services, but again, the thing that people, that customers really respond to is reliability mm -hmm. and understanding whether or not these models hallucinate or they give misinformation. I mean, these models fabricate very realistic sounding and confident information. Uh, the author, Neil Gaiman, had a really great take where he said it's, it's truth-shaped information. And I think I have not heard a better way of describing what comes out of language models, right? So it can be truthful. It cannot be truthful. The point, the point is it is truth. -shaped. It sounds truthful. It is saying it to you <laughs> yeah, with absolute confidence. Yeah. yeah. But it's your job to assess whether or not yeah. this, this item is truthful or not truthful. And for companies then 
the hard part is how, how can you be that second layer of trust and safety, right? So all the companies that you may be building your technologies off of, whether it's Anthropic or OpenAI or Google, they've done one round of trust and safety, right? Like mm -hmm. ensuring high level responsible ethical output, but they're not customizing for shopping or travel. And now that's the company's job that's building the plugin. And back to your question of like, how can startups, it's not even startups anymore. It's companies that have never thought about building this functionality or this feature. They realize, well, I don't have to invest in an engineering team anymore, but now I have to invest in some sort of product testing, trust and safety. Training team. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. I'm interested, you know, you're, you're, you're right there at the kind of the forefront of, of many of these discussions around, you know, ethical and inclusive uh, AI development and kind of holding the industry accountable. What do you think governments uh, should be doing um, at this juncture and where we're at in 2023? What would you like to see happen? Oh, I'm glad you brought that because you mentioned the whole nanny state idea or surveillance state. One of my concerns is that there is such a push for regulation, and I agree there needs to be regulation, but I worry that there, it, it, people think that's either a free-for-all or regulated. And what happens with a lot of regulation is you need surveillance. Mm -hmm. You need to track everything everyone's doing in order to ensure people are being regulated appropriately or things are compliant. And we, we have missed talking about that middle space. And this middle space exists in other industries. You know, I keep raising information security because it's a really great example where they're actually independent actors who act as these red teamers or ethical hackers. Mm -hmm. And they don't work for a company and they don't work for the government. They may work with them. They may do projects with them, but they don't have a paycheck coming in every mm -hmm. two weeks. And as a result, they are actually acting essentially on behalf of whoever it is they think they represent, on behalf of the public, on behalf of some particular group of users or people. Mm -hmm. What I'd love is the cultivation of that mm -hmm. space. And, you know, and the, the hacker community is still working on this, like getting the kinds of legal protections, mm -hmm. yeah. for example, so that people who are testing these models aren't then pushed with, you know, oh, you're violating the terms of service or slap with a lawsuit. Um, so, you know, what I would love to see is some focus on developing mm -hmm. an independent body mm -hmm. that is not government, not industry, in order to be that middle ground and truly represent the voice of what people want to see. Very interesting. I, actually, to be honest with you, that's kind of the first time I've heard that idea. It's very compelling. Yeah, it makes a lot yeah. of sense. I know there's some talk about some universal principles. I think UNESCO mm -hmm. has been sort of charting out, like, here's some paths that we need to take from like a thinking framework um, around what are the principles that should govern versus mm -hmm. just regulate. Um, and so it sounds like there's some emerging systems that are starting to be created that sound really fascinating. Yeah, actually, one of my other passions is thinking through global governance. So mm -hmm. in April, I had the op-ed in Wired where I called for global governance of AI mm. systems. These are global companies and they act borderlessly. This technology is borderless and the impacts are felt mm -hmm. disproportionately throughout the world. It is actually limiting in some cases to be bound by a country's borders. Mm -hmm. And that's why you see what's called the Brussels effect, right? Mm -hmm. The EU passing mm -hmm. laws that impact the US because it's literally the mm -hmm. only way to protect EU citizens is to say, well, we can't just recognize this within our borders because these companies don't mm -hmm. exist in our borders. So I talked a bit about what global governance is and what it should be. And I had a follow up in The Hill where what I talked about is actually getting at your question. I actually think a global governance entity should focus on human flourishing. And specifically, I use the phrase mm -hmm. human flourishing, which, is, which comes from Aristotle. And it's not, it's like beyond the idea of just functioning, right? Yeah. It's more, like flourishing means different things to different people. But if this technology truly is as great as we want it to be, if it's going to get rid of all the mundane work, mm -hmm. what's left? Well, what's left is for us to be more human and to flourish. And the, the distinction I make here is there is a difference between not doing harm and doing good. Mm -hmm. So the focus of global governance should not be about punishing companies if they do bad things. It should be about incentivizing this technology to be used for net global human benefit. That's incredible. I could speak to you all day. I'm yeah. sure Brian, and I, Brian and I could speak to you all day. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for your work. You were recently featured in a Rolling Stone um, article <laughs> recently, which is absolutely phenomenal with other amazing women yes. researchers who've been sounding the alarm on ethical AI and responsible AI. And so just congratulations to you, you. And thank you for speaking with our audience today. And just thank you for being here. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's been a wonderful conversation. Thank you.